Good evening, Pastor Kent here on this ninth day of February 2022, joining with you uh, in your homes uh, for a time of Bible study and reflection and prayer, and it's always uh, good to be together um, around God's holy word. So good evening. I hope uh, everything has been good for you today. We'll begin with our Bible study. We are in the middle of a study looking at uh, some of the most um, uh, surprising, uh, bizarre, strange scripture passages that we find in both the Old and the New Testament. And we're basing this off an article that was published by Live Science um, that was commenting on a book um, that was produced in 2021. Tonight, um, we're looking at uh, the section on the um, article that's found online. Uh, that mentions other mysterious resurrections, other mysterious resurrections. And uh, the scripture passage that is mentioned um, is uh, from Matthew's gospel, chapter 27, verse uh, 22. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. The brief article states that the gospel doesn't tell us much more about these other people who came back to life. What were they like after they were resurrected? How long did they live afterwards? Did they resume their previous lives? How did they interact with their family members? The Bible provides little insight uh, into these questions. Indeed, it is one of those mysterious passages. I remember uh, sitting in the front row uh, in my uh, seminary class in the study of the New Testament, and we were looking at this book of Matthew. And I remember asking the professor specifically about this passage, and he never really would answer me directly. He just, uh, just kind of brief, uh, buzzed over it, but did not really give me an answer, which I thought was interesting, because it is a puzzling text uh, for many people. Now, we need to look at the text in context, and so let's, let's do that. We want to back up to verse um, 45, and then, and, read through, um, and then read through uh, 54, and I'll make comments along the way. Um, the, the important thing to understand here is that sometimes these passages can seem very confusing when taken out of context and not understanding the history behind uh, uh, the Bible text and, and what was expected. But this is, is just part. This is um, a previous verse before that is, is like a little puzzling in, as well. So let's look at the text. It says that now uh, from the sixth hour of darkness, and this is Jesus had been crucified. It says uh, from the sixth hour of darkness uh, fell on the land until the ninth hour. Now, the, the, the day of the Lord's coming in the book of Amos talked about it being the days of darkness. And so this very symbolic understanding here that uh, this was 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 day of the Lord. Um, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, in the for, for, verse 46, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, wow, how why hast thou forsaken me? You know, this, these were the last words we see um, of Jesus in Matthew's gospel, um, and as well in Mark's gospel. Verse 47 says, And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. So obviously they misunderstood what he was saying because he's quoting uh, from one of the Psalms. Um, that does say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, in that particular Psalms, it goes on. It becomes very positive. But that particular passage, indeed, is, is a question uh, for Christians. Did Jesus feel forsaken on the cross by God? Um, my, my belief is, indeed, he did. He had to. God um, had, had said before, earlier, that at some point he would have to a look away, uh, forsake uh, Israel, the people there, because of their sin. And Jesus, being one who was dying for all of our sin, had to look away. He could, he had to forsake 
forsake the one who was being punished for everyone's sin, because that was what was required. And so that, I guess that was probably the most bitter thing that Jesus had to experience was, you know, he was, he had, he was forsaken by God. Uh, he felt that, that separation. Being forsaken means separated from God. And that separation is, is indeed the worst thing that we can ever have to feel separated uh, from our, our God, our creator, uh, the one who loves us. Um, we think about feeling forsaken or being separated from other people, but nothing is like being forsaken and separated by God. And that was indeed Jesus' full human experience there uh, before he died. Um, the those standing around, and immediately one of the one of them ran and taken a sponge, he filled it with sour wine, he put it on the reed and gave it to him to drink. Again, uh, mocking him, they didn't really want to give him any relief from his thirst, but rather maybe to, to moisten his lips, so maybe he had something else to say um, uh, while he was on the cross. Um, but uh, the rest of them said, "Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him." Now, indeed, Elijah was, was supposed to be one uh, of those who would come back uh, before the Messiah. And so they, again, were, were kind of poking fun at him uh, that, uh, you know, Elijah wasn't going to save him. And uh, they were teasing um, at the situation. Jesus 50 says, And Jesus then cried out in a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So there he, he, he dies. There on the cross, after saying, after saying and feeling forsaken by God, and then we find the passage that we're talking about tonight. And the tombs were opened. Um, excuse me. Um, verse, I, I, I skipped a verse. Verse fifty. Uh, uh, verse fifty-one. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. That indicates that the that the veil there in the temple. Um, was torn by God from the top to the bottom. God, you know, being seen kind of visioned up and down, not torn by someone below it, but from um, God above, uh, it was torn. And that opening up um, um, the, the temple or the, being in the presence of God or access to God uh, for everyone, not just uh, for the, the high priest. We, 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 in a sense, all become priests before God in that in that way. Um and then it says that um, and the earth shook, again, from the Old Testament. That's another one of the signs of, of God's power and majesty in his coming uh, down into the earth. And the rocks were split. So you had this whole, this whole um, cataclysmic event that was taking place of, of an earthquake um, that, that would, would, would tear the temple um, uh, veil into. And then verse 52 and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, do we understand this literally? At, at that moment, they were raised. Um, some scholars believe it's, it's a foresight of what would take place um, in the in the future um, when when the saints were raised. A uh, more of a, of a vision uh, for for people um, to get a glimpse of what is awaiting us. Um, indeed, the Bible never speaks of these individuals again. There's never any mention of this in the New Testament or who they were or what they were. So it leads us to believe that this was just um, uh, a, a a vision of what was about to was a, what was about to happen. That certain people, it says now now um, coming out of the tombs. They entered the holy city and appeared to many, um, appeared to many, but not everyone. Uh, people with the eyes of faith to see, they appeared to. Um, and I also note that they didn't come, they didn't come out immediately. Um, um, it was after, it says verse 53, and after his resurrection, they entered and appeared. So um, this event of, of the death of Jesus, um, uh, was was an event like none other, where people had uh, uh, visions of indeed uh, the the power of God in the future to raise people to life, uh, and when Jesus was raised, indeed uh, people maybe maybe saw raised spirits 
um, of their loved ones um, to 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 announce what was what had taken place in in the death of Jesus. That's important that we can continue to read on. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening. And of course, there's maybe other things that were happening, not recorded here. They became very frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. In Mark's gospel, it was only the centurion. But now it was the centurion and his other soldiers that were mentioned in this. They were all believing because of these events that were taking place. And verse 55 and 56, and many women who were there looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministered to him among them whom was mary magdalene along with mary the mother of james and joseph and the mother of the sons of zebedee now again obviously these women looking on from a distance uh, at the events that were taking place poor jesus being all alone none of his disciples were there none of his, his, his closest friends were there not not even the women could be near him they were off at a distance he felt utterly alone, abandoned, rejected by God. But yet, in the end, God raised him to a new life. Perhaps sometimes you feel alone, rejected, abandoned, maybe by family or friends, or maybe even your church. We want you to know, God wants you to know, that he loves you. And that while he had to turn away from looking at the sin of Jesus on the cross, he will never turn away from you. He loves you. Your sins have been forgiven. If you are in Christ, you have confessed your sins. You have asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Your sins have been forgiven. You never have to feel alone and abandoned because God, through Jesus Christ, is always there for you. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we are just so thankful for these words that seem strange to us, but to your wonderful mystery, we can understand and know that we are loved by you. That you never turn away from us. Even though others may reject us, we may feel abandoned, Lord, that there are signs that are presented before us, um, Lord, that give us an opportunity to, to, to see your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember when I was a young boy, my father died. I've told this to my congregation before. Um, I had a, 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 a vision as a five-year-old uh, would. I, you know, that's a long time ago. I was young. Uh, you know, you, we can rationalize it and say, you know, it was just a, a, a wish in my mind. But the night my father died, um, I heard the news. My mother was crying there, pregnant with my younger brother. And I, I was taken into a back room uh, to, to be told what happened. And as I, as I, as I remember it, I, as I looked out the window into the heavens, I saw an image of my father, um, my, my earthly father there. Uh, now, I don't know if that was something that that, that image that's only happened to me once, that image of of assurance to know that my father was okay, just as maybe some of these individuals, because of what Christ did on the cross for humanity, they knew that those saints, those followers of Jesus, maybe had passed away uh, before uh, all this event, that they were safe in the hands of God too. I, I, I like to think that that is so. Let's turn then to our weekly prayer list. Uh, we uh, want to give praise that the Cobb family was here at church and they're doing better. Uh, Ellen is, is still awaiting uh, the birth of that baby, so we want to keep them in prayer. Remember uh, Teresa and uh, her family as they grieve uh, still the, the passing of their uh, father, Carl. Remember Trayton and Lorene. Remember Norma Jean, um, Gary, Helen, Aaron. Uh, Bobby, uh, remember uh, Jimmy Rhodes, uh, remember my son Nathan. Of course, we always want to remember the homeless, and uh, we want to add uh, to uh, prayer request uh, from Edna about her grandnephew Derek. Remember uh, Robert and Shirley, uh, Johnny, Nicole, 
and she has a family member, a young, very young family member who's uh, sick. We want to pray for uh, for her. Remember, um, remember Barbara and Debbie and Jack, Janine and Glenn and Robbie and um, Gethsemane Baptist Church. That's Bobby's church. Remember Linda and Bill and Betty and Kate, Katie and Patricia and Lynn. Butch and Daryl's uh, father, and remember Ernie, um, Kathy, um, Dockery, the friend of Judy and Bear. We want to remember her in their prayers. And uh, today, this morning, uh, Keith has uh, surgery on his shoulder. So do remember uh, Keith in your prayers as well. We always want to remember our homeless: Lucille, Margaret, Ramona, Mitsu. Uh, these I'm not I'm not our homeless, but our home pal. I'm sorry, Lucille, Margaret, Ramona, Mitsu, Jimmy, Shirley, Dolores, Lorene, Jean, and Francis. Let us join together uh, as we pray for these. Oh God, we bring these names before your throne this evening, knowing that you are already at work in their lives, and we thank you for that, Lord. Just continue, Lord, to bless them and and heal them and comfort them and and um, encourage them in these days that they know of your love for them, of your son going to the cross, uh, being uh, abandoned by you because of sin, that uh, through his sacrifice and through his faithfulness, Lord, we can all have eternal life. Amen. God be with you until uh, we uh, see one another again. Hope to see you Sunday. Good night.